everybody. I'd like to introduce you to Taylor Campbell. Taylor was one of the few people who sent multiple pretty good talk suggestions to the program committee and we randomly selected this one. <laughs> but how did you randomly select it? <laughs> so welcome to the Entropic Principle about um, dev random and dev you random. Um, I don't actually know of a concept called the Entropic Principle. I just thought it sounded funny when I was thinking of a title. Um, so I'd like to start by saying if you don't take anything else away from this talk, um, just know that when you're writing an application and you need to make a random choice, use DevView Random. It's a safe thing to do, it'll work anywhere, and even though you might have this notion that it is, a, it is only a, a, a false idol of randomness, or it's only pseudo-random, not really random, that's actually not really right. It's, it's, it, it'll work. So, dev random and dev u random are uh, device nodes on pretty much any uh, modern Unix system. Um, they have the property that when you read anything from them, when you read a byte from them, uh, nobody can predict, other than the kernel, what that byte you'll read is. Um, they also have the property that uh, you can influence what future reads will yield by writing to them, but I'll, I'll get to that later about entropy sources. Um, now, they're different in that when you read from dev random rather than dev u random, dev random will sometimes block. Now, the usual explanation of what's going on there is that there's something about information theory and real randomness versus pseudo-randomness and deterministic stuff, but really, the real difference is that dev random sometimes blocks and dev u random never blocks. Um, and there is uh, uh, no shortage of um, very confused verbiage on the internet about what the nature of the difference is. But that's the, the real difference is dev random blocks, dev u random doesn't. So, why does it matter that it be unpredictable? Well, there are bad guys on the internet. When you're writing any sort of engineering system that talks to the internet, it is your responsibility to make sure that um, people don't eavesdrop on your conversations, and they don't intercept your conversations, and they will, because there are, there are, there are people like um, <clears throat> uh, this, this character, Mr. James Clapper. Well, he doesn't do it personally, but um, th there's lots of nasty stuff on the internet, and um, uh, we need crypto in order to avoid the nasty stuff, and in order for crypto to work, the parties involved in communicating over the internet need to have secrets that the bad guys cannot predict. If the bad guys can, can predict the secrets, then the crypto doesn't work. Um, here are some examples of uh, where people used crypto and failed to make sure that the secrets were actually unpredictable. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a uh, Taiwanese national identity database, and it used a bunch of RSA keys that were generated by smart cards that were all thoroughly certified, except that the, well, actually, the certification process didn't make sure that the random number generator actually worked. So a lot of the RSA keys had factors in common. Oops. Um, Sony uh, used a uh, um, signature scheme for fir signing firmware updates. Only they screwed up this, the use of the signature scheme so that um, they accidentally revealed the signing key to the world. Um, and so anybody could sign PlayStation firmware updates. Um, similar to the Taiwanese National Identity uh, Database, um, there was a project which you may have heard about, Factorable.net, um, just surveying machines on the internet with uh, TLS, SSL servers, and found that a lot of them had secrets that were entirely predictable. Um, and when the NSA <coughs> allegedly chose to uh, put a backdoor into a major US government crypto standard, they chose, <coughs> allegedly, uh, the random number generator. So, uh, this is obviously a very important part of uh, eavesdropping and interception. Now, whenever we're talking about a um, uh, security system, um, in order to avoid the sort of voodoo that you encounter in discussions of, uh, lots of discussions of dev random and dev u random, you have to have a, an application in mind. What are you trying to accomplish with this system? You have to have a threat model, uh, who is trying to screw you up, and you have to have a set of intended security properties. What are you trying to make sure the bad guys can't do? 
Um, so in this case, uh, we are trying to um, just generate bits with uniform random distribution. Um, th there are several possible threat models we might consider. Um, a very easy one is that uh, the attacker might be reading from dev random or dev random uh, on the same machine. Um, now, maybe not by running a process on that machine, but maybe by looking at the TLS um, uh, packets on some other conversation, which reveals some output that's usually directly from the um, application random number generator. Um, another threat model is that the attacker may try to influence dev random by feeding in uh, uh, by feeding an entropy from um, either by like banging on your own keyboard or by sending network packet timings, which are where uh, is two places where the operating system um, uh, tries to uh, uh, derive some of its random decisions. Another possible threat model is the attacker um, can totally compromise your machine and get at the total, the complete internal state of kernel memory. Um, now. This is um, not a threat model that uh, you can do all that much about, but there is one thing that, um, that, that, we, that we can defend against uh, with that, which is about um, uh, um, making sure that if you have generated a key from dev random or dev random in the past, and somebody later compromises your machine, you want to make sure that they still can't predict what your key was. Um, so these are three different threat models that are relevant in um, uh, uh, in, in discussion, discussion of dev random and of u random, and any time that you're worried about the, the security properties, you need to consider the threat models that the, the properties are relative to. So we want to make sure that whatever the attacker is, um, they shouldn't be able to predict any output from dev random or dev u random that they haven't seen before. Um, now, if they get the total internal state, they can predict future outputs because if your machine is rooted, then you're hosed in the future. Um, but they shouldn't be able to predict any past ones. They shouldn't be able to figure out what PGP key you generated last week. So, um, in order to uh, uh, discuss what unpredictable to an attacker means, we have to have some formalization of unpredictability. Uh, and we're going to use the language of probability theory uh, very briefly, in just a couple of slides, uh, to uh, talk about that. So a random variable is just a model for a physical system that you can imagine observing. And you can imagine it taking on some particular value, say little x0, little x1, whatever. Um, and uh, we have a you know, probability theory notation for writing what the probability of observing one particular value of this random variable, of this physical system, is. Um, now, given a random variable, uh, we need some way to measure how unpredictable it is. Because random variable here just means that there is some level of uncertainty in what you might observe. Um, but it doesn't mean anything beyond that. It doesn't mean uniform random, for example. Um, so uh, the usual popular approach of measuring um, how unpredictable a, a physical observation, a physical system, a random variable is, is Shannon entropy. And um, you've probably heard of information theory and uh, entropy in the past. And this is the formal definition of it. Um, roughly, it gives the, uh, if you have an, uh, an, a physical system um, that has some number of bits of information uh, literally, like you, you have, you consider um, you know, maybe a pair of coin flips that has two bits of information, well, two bits of output, literally. Um, but if the probability of, if for some reason you're going to flip always heads uh, for both of them or always tails for both of them, and you're never going to flip heads for one and tails for the other or tails for one and heads for the other, then um, the entropy in this physical process of flipping two coins um, is only one bit of, of actual entropy per bits of the random variable. So the, um, the rate of information is, is one half bit of entropy per bit of output. Um, so that's a popular thing that you will encounter in, in information theory and especially in, in, in coding theory and dis discussing, you know, character correcting codes and communication channels and whatnot. Um, but it's actually not terribly useful for crypto because um, if we have some random variable, big X, say, and there are a lot of possibility, possible observations for what X is, and let's say maybe X is your choice of password, um, and half the time you choose the password hunter too, but all of the times you choose uniformly at random from the other possibilities, um, 
the Shannon entropy makes it look like there's there's it, it looks like there's a lot of entropy in here. That is, it, it looks like there's um, if I wanted to if I as an attacker wanted to exhaustively search the possibilities to looking for your password, um, if I had some way to check the, whether your whether my guess is correct, um, Shannon entropy says that should take a long time, right? Um, because if there are um, well, yeah, you know, if there are two to the 128 possibilities, then you have to search about half of those before you get the, get the right one, on average. Um, but in this case, I have a pretty good guess what your password is if this is, if this is the model that I have. And this is how you know, password crackers like John the Ripper work. They have a, um, you know, the passwords are not chosen uniformly at random, and John the Ripper will guess, it's gonna guess password first. It's gonna guess password one, two, three next, probably, and Hunter two is probably pretty high up there. Um, so instead, in crypto, we use a concept called min entropy, which is uh, a measure of um, sort of the worst case here, rather than the average case. Um, so uh, in, in, in the case of uh, half the time your password is Hunter 2, and all the rest of the cases, it's, you know, the, each, each possibility has a very low probability, the min entropy of that is going to be 1 half. Um, and, or, or rather, it's going to be 1. Um, there's only one bit of min entropy there, which is means very predictable. Um, now, if we're looking at a random variable with uniform distribution, that is, every possibility has the same probability, um, for example, a nice unbiased coin where the heads and tails both have one half probability, then the min entropy is just the number of bits in, uh, of, of the possible outcome. So if, if, you, if you have you know, a one bit outcome, then the min entropy of that is going to be one. If you have a 128 bit um, string, if you're drawing from randomly from those, and with uniform distribution, then the min entropy of that is going to be 128. Um, and in crypto, um, the standard practice is to use, um, if you're, you know, if, if you're making a very weak system, maybe 80 bits, but usually at least 128, or if you're a little more paranoid or worried about quantum computing, then 256 bits of min entropy. Okay. So, the kernel's job with uh, dev random and dev u random is um, to make reading k bits from the device, um, that is the physical process of reading k bits from the device, that, that, should, that should, if you model to a random variable, have k bits of entropy. Um, so it is, it is it, it's supposed to be very hard for an attacker to predict what the bits are. And if you draw you know, one bit, then it's, well, the attacker has a 50-50 chance of guessing right. If you draw 128 bits, the attacker has a very, very, very small chance of guessing right. Um, now, how does the kernel choose which bits to produce? Of course, if the kernel is a nice single-threaded computer program, then it should be deter nice, you know, deterministic. But kernels have access to uh, physical devices, of course. Um, and they um, make various non-deterministic non observations of the um, uh, physical devices that are attached to them. For example, the uh, computers usually have more than one clock in them, and two clocks are never quite synchronized right. Um, so if you look at the skew between the two clocks, that may be a little bit harder, you know, a little hard to predict if you're not actually observing the clocks yourself. So if, if you are an attacker on the other end of the Ethernet cable, um, it may be hard for you to observe the two oscillators inside uh, the computer you're trying to attack. Um, other possibilities are the timings of network packets or um, keyboard input, you know, what, how far apart my keystrokes are and which keys I'm hitting. So if you run gpg dash dash gen key to produce a new key, it'll print out a message kind of like this. Well, not literally this, but um, uh, asking you to bang on the keyboard like a monkey until it has enough entropy to generate the key. Um, so all of these uh, devices that the um, kernel observes are themselves random variables, but they don't have nice uniform distribution. Um, the uh, spacing between my keystrokes is very much non-uniform. Right now, I am not typing any keys at all, so there's a very long gap. But if I were to go and type the URL to this presentation, then there would be a whole bunch of very short gaps. So it's not, it's not uniform at all. Um, and sometimes these uh, um, sources of entropy are under the influence of attackers. So if you have a network attacker and you're using the time between network packets as a source of entropy, um, as a source of unpredictability for dev random on your system, then, well, maybe the attacker can send packets on very regular intervals, you know, maybe every millisecond or something, or every 10 milliseconds. 
Um, or if the attacker is trying to log into your, you know, uh, uh, unlock your screen lock, maybe your attacker can bang on the keyboard very robotically rather than like a monkey. Um, and so that, yes, well, or the, the, or the attacker can hold on to the space key until the uh, screen locker crashes, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> So, um, in order to do this, the kernel um, uses some crypto magic called an entropy extractor. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of all the, all the crypto here. Um, and so, but basically, it, it pours all the entropy sources into a funnel and mixes them around so that they look a lot more uniform. Um, rather than uh, very non-uniform, like a bang on the keyboard like a robot, or you know, long gaps between keystrokes and followed by very short ones. And then, once the kernel has mixed all this into a big funnel and produced a little output, it will use that as the seed for a pseudo-random number generator. That is a deterministic program that expands a short, unpredictable um, secret into a very long sequence of unpredictable secrets. Um, now, you notice I said um, th this is the case for dev random and dev u random. There's no difference between them here. It's not that dev random usually spits out stuff directly from the uh, entropy funnel, the, the entropy pool here, and dev u random makes something up and then uses a deterministic algorithm to spit out results. They both go through the same pseudo random number generator. They, they, they both go through, go through the same deterministic process seeded by bits from the um, entropy sources. Now, what if you don't have all that much entropy? What if um, I've just booted up the machine, I just hit the power button, and I haven't typed any keystrokes? And it's a fresh install of my operating system, and SSHD starts up and auto-generates keys. Then, well, if I did this twice, there's a good chance I would get the same results. Or at the very least, there's a fairly small collection of results that I might get that an attacker could easily cycle through. Um, similar to the... Uh, Debian um, OpenSSL debacle several years ago, where um, the OpenSSL uh, user land uh, PRNG um, was using a seed that was much too small, so that there was only a very small number of possible keys that it would ever produce. Um, so uh, this would be bad. Um, and you want to prevent uh, anything from trying to use entropy when, there I when the system is actually predictable. Um, so how do we prevent this? Well, the naive answer is that we wait until I have banged on the keyboard like a monkey, uh, wait until the disk has started spinning and we've observed the heads on the disk have taken some time to move around and or we've observed some network packets and that's enough, but, uh, and, and then, well, so traditionally, um, dev random will block until the system has determined that enough of these events have happened. I banged on the keyboard like, like enough of a monkey, not enough of a robot, but enough of a monkey. Um, or there have come, enough network packets have come in. Um, so applications can use dev random as a sort of um, barrier to wait for entropy to become available. Um, so uh, you could, for example, you could have just an, an init script um, in your little embedded system that reads from dev random before it launches anything that needs entropy. Um, as, as, as soon as dev random returns, the kernel has determined, I think that I'm unpredictable enough. Um, dev u random, in contrast, never blocks. Um, so uh, even if you use it early at boot before you bang on the keyboard like a monkey, it will not block, it will just return data that, well, might be actually predictable. Um, so even if there's been nothing fed into the entropy pool, the kernel will use, I mean, it might be all zeros as a key, as a seed for the PRNG. Um, the trouble is, with the obligatory Dilbert reference, um, you can't actually tell from any particular state whether that state is unpredictable. If I roll a you know, D10 six times and get nines out as a result, that's a perfectly valid result, even if the die is totally fair. And you can't tell just from looking at the output whether I actually rolled the die to produce the result or whether I just read Dilbert. 
Um, what you can do, and which Dilbert doesn't really uh, uh, address, is, is uh, assess whether the process that you're using to produce the output is unpredictable. So if I tell you I'm going to roll a d10 six times, then, well, you have a uh, ten to the sixth, one in ten to the sixth chance of guessing what the, right, what the outcome will be. Um, whereas uh, if I tell you that I got nine, 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 then, well, the chance of that is, is one. Um, so the trouble, uh, so yeah, the, the, it's, it's hard to, um, for a kernel to determine whether it is currently unpredictable. Um, it can try to make some estimates by using a deterministic algorithm to, pr to try to predict itself what the next output of the entropy source will be. Or given two outputs, it will try to assess if I knew the first output, would the second output be a surprise to me? Um, and so there's some ad hoc logic in most kernels that will um, try to guess. Do these look like they're, does this look like it's unpredictable given the first output? And if so, maybe I got one bit of entropy. Maybe I got two bits of entropy. And uh, it will slowly add up the bits of entropy that it has counted using this ad hoc approach until it gets to a certain threshold. Um, but this isn't really a good solution because um, you can uh, you could uh, you could certainly imagine using a um, uh, you know using a, a sequence of keystroke timings that you got from a pseudo number generator seeded by zero. So um, the output of that will look indistinguishable to random as somebody who doesn't know the seed was zero. But if you know the seed is zero, then you can predict exactly what the resulting output will be. So um, it's not, it's, uh, there's, there's no real good answer here. Um, uh, you ju it's just, it's a matter of system engineering to decide how, uh, um, uh, you know, how in your whole system you can determine whether there's enough entropy. There's also this other concept of running out of entropy, which you'll encounter in a lot of the man pages and documentation on the web and discussions on the web and the interwebs and, and, and IRC and everywhere about how um, sometimes if you use a lot of data from dev random, you'll deplete the entropy pool. You'll run out of entropy, like run out of gas when you're driving your car or something. And then all of a sudden your car slows down and it, and it can't produce secrets anymore. Um, and that actually it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, the, the only way that it, it conceivably um, ha makes sense in the real world, no, not in the real world, in the theoretical world, is that if an attacker witnessed the whole internal state of your kernel and then walked away without doing anything with it and you got some more entropy, maybe then you would want to wait a little bit after they've read your whole internal state before trying to read more from dev random. But if the attacker has already witnessed the full internal state of your kernel, there's a good chance they can do lots of other nefarious things, and you probably just don't want to use that machine anymore. Um, so, um, why would you know uh, that that very peculiar theoretical use case aside? Why would you want to block in dev random long after boot? Well, there actually is a reason. Um, so if you're using dev random as a sort of unpredictability barrier, that is, as a way to ask the system, please uh, wait until, you know, or let me know when um, uh, you've got enough entropy, you would like to keep that code path exercised because if you run your application on your laptop, your development laptop, you'll always have enough entropy. So it'll never block. You'll never actually use the, you'll never actually see the code path where the blocking happens. You'll see your application just snappily goes along and read stuff from dev random and it never blocks. Um, until you write an application that someone else at some other company uses on an embedded device and they find that it causes all of their network to hang once they did an update to add your new code. And, and that was because you started using dev random and now all of their devices don't have enough entropy at boot and you never tested the blocking code path and it, they just never get past boot because your application never launched because it couldn't get entropy from dev random. Um, all that said, that's a fairly obscure use case, and most applications are 
totally happy with just using DevView Random. So let me reiterate. If you're writing an application that needs an unpredictable secret, use DevView Random. Now, what if there are no entropy sources, like on such an embedded device where at boot it just didn't have anything? Um, there's no disk, there's no mouse you can move around, there's no keyboard you can bang on, and even if you had a keyboard, the monkey wouldn't help you. Um, so in that case, the system, well, the kernel and the whole system, might be totally deterministic. Um, and it can't provide anything from DevU random usefully. That is, anything it spits out of Dev random or DevU random, an attacker can predict, because they can buy the same embedded device, run the same software on it, and get exactly the same outputs. Um, and this is presumably what happened with the um, uh, uh, factorable.net uh, survey that would resulting in the um, uh, mining your P's and Q's paper. Um, there were presumably a lot of embedded appliances that just had no entropy, and they booted up and generated the keys, and on two different appliances, it was the same keys, or at least one of the same factors, because there wasn't much entropy, just a little tiny bit. Um, so this is a, a real problem in practice. Um, and, well, one thing you can do is when you install your system, when you flash, the, flash it with an OS image, um, which you maybe do from your laptop or from something else, uh, your laptop probably is in an unpredictable state. So you can take some entropy from dev random on your laptop and just store it on the embedded device in a little non-volatile storage location. It takes only 32 bytes to be reliable. That's 256 bits, and that's enough for any crypto. Um, and uh, then um, uh, you might later also want to uh, uh, um, save it again when you reboot the embedded device and so you can restore it when you start up again so that each boot will get different outputs so it doesn't generate the same session keys over and over again. Um, and if you do this, then you don't need in your whole system um, the use of dev random as an unpredictability barrier because the whole system has ensured there's your whole process of flashing the device with entropy derived from your laptop or something. Um, so the whole system has ensured that uh, the, 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 the system is, is, always in an well, is always unpredictable to an attacker. Um, now, um, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the kernel will draw from various different possible sources of entropy. That is, various possible different physical systems. And um, sometimes these physical systems are under the influence of an attacker. Um, you know, the attacker can easily influence network packet timings, especially if they're on a LAN, on the same LAN as you. For example, if you're in a, a coffee shop and, and the attacker is on the same Wi-Fi network. Um, sometimes the attacker can influence keystroke timings. I mean, if you leave your laptop unattended, an attacker can just walk up and type at it. Um, sometimes you might be worried about the attacker um, compromising your CPU. And this sounds really far-fetched, um, uh, but um, it is, I see some people shaking their heads here because to them it is not far-fetched, but um, uh, y you might argue that if an attacker can compromise your CPU, then what's the point of worrying about anything else? They got your CPU, and so that's, you're hosed, you're, 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 you're gone, you're done. Um, but it's um, very easy in theory to um, modify the, for example, the read RAND instruction on Intel CPUs uh, so that it has certain biases. Now, the biases are going to be hard for you and I to predict or to even measure, um, but for the dedicated attacker who put them there, maybe there is a secret key that lets them distinguish the bias or let, lets them, you know, lets, lets them uh, uh, follow the biases through, say, a TLS session. Um, and the same very dedicated attacker who can make a little tiny change to your CPU that you're not going to detect even with a microscope. Um, there was a paper just last year, uh, um, uh, what was it, CHES, I forget what that, anyway, um, about um, how you could modify the, C the silicon so that you can't detect it with a CPU, but some bits are wired to zero inside or something. So an attacker who maybe can do that, maybe they don't want to more broadly compromise your CPU. Maybe they don't want to add a bunch more gates in it that will leak information somewhere else. Maybe they don't want to make it, you know, leave tracks that will um, make it clear that they did actually compromise your CPU. Um, so 
At this point, I would like to mention that um, uh, when I started looking into DevRandom and WRandom and NetBSD um, about a year and a half ago, um, I found that on FreeBSD, um, on IV, Intel IV Bridge systems, which were the first ones that supported the read rand instruction, uh, DevRandom and DevUrandom both sourced directly from the read rand instruction. That is, there were no other entropy sources involved. No matter how much you banked on your keyboard like a monkey, that wouldn't affect the output of DevRandom. It was only from the CPU's rand number generator. Um, I, uh, I talked to some FreeBSD, so I talked to Colin Percival about this, and, and uh, at the time he said, well, if they can compromise your CPU, then it's not much of an issue. Um, one year ago, after some of Mr. Snowden's disclosures, FreeBSD reverted to using the read rand as just one of several entropy sources. Ah, uh, so for so, it's not very <laughs> uh, so for the for the uh, recorded audience, um, Jörg just uh, added that in, there was a Northbridge uh, random number generator some time ago, um, uh, to which Intel applied a die shrink, and in doing so, some of the diodes inside that were supposed to provide noise, that were supposed to provide entropy, went away and stopped providing entropy. Um, so. Um, in addition to uh, um, the, the sort of mundane and not very uniform uh, entropy sources that I've discussed, um, there are also various hardware run and generators, hardware entropy sources on the market. Now you can get PCI devices that you could add to your, you know, add to your workstation. Various um, systems on chip uh, have uh, entropy sources on the die. Um, and then there are CPU instructions, like the Intel read rand instruction or the um, VIA padlock instructions. Um, now, I've never personally looked into how any of these physically work. Um, if you pay money for them, you would hope that they work well to be unpredictable, but who knows? I don't know. Um, so actually, my favorite hardware entropy source um, you probably have in your pocket. Um, it is just a coin here. and now. If you are practiced, you can make yourself reliably uh, flip to heads or tails, whichever you want. But um, to all of you folks, what I flip is pretty unpredictable. And in fact, I'm not very good at, I, I don't even know how to, how to make it flip heads or tails myself. Um, so um, uh, I mentioned earlier you can write to DevRandom. And so you can act as your own little entropy source. Writing to DevRandom just provides entropy that goes into the entropy funnel and then is used to seed the PRNG. And so if you, if you want to generate a key that you're kind of paranoid about and you're confident there are no cameras looking at you, um, so you know, maybe do it in your own bathroom at home or something, and hope you haven't attracted the interest of a large nation state, then um, just it takes, I mean, 128 flips if you, know, if, you, if you want a decent key. If you're bored, you can do 256 times. It's, you know, it just takes a couple minutes. Um, and for a long-term key, you know, if you want a key, a key to last for 10 years without being compromised, without being gassed, then you know, maybe a couple minutes is worth that time. Um, so um, that's all about the um, uh, dev random and dev u random in general. Um, about a year and a half ago, as I mentioned, I started looking at the implementation in NetBSD um, and uh, found a lot of things where I wanted to improve it. Um, so just a few little details of how it works in NetBSD. Um, when you open dev random, when you open dev u random, uh, you'll get uh, your own per thread or per, or, well, your, your own per file descriptor um, state or per CPU state if you um, just make small reads from dev u random, which is a little bit silly. I'm not sure that's the right thing, but uh, so the, the point of this is that uh, dev random and dev u random on NetBSD scale. You don't need to worry about multiprocessor issues. They're, they're they're not you know if Two processes reading from dev u random can do it on di different cores without interfering. Um, for generating key material for crypto, um, uh, NetBSD uses uh, the um, NIST counter mode uh, DRBG, deterministic random bit generator, synonym for PRNG, pseudo random number generator. Um, this is not the famous dual EC DRBG. This is one of the uh, three totally reasonable um, uh, algorithms in the same standard. Um, which uh, it's uh, not plausible to have been backdoored. Um, 
So it it's just uses uh, a block cipher in counter mode to generate some outputs and then reseed itself from the last output of the block cipher. And we use AES-128. Um, for um, non-key material inside the kernel, we use a much faster PRNG, much faster uh, a stream cipher, ChaCha8. Um, this is only for um, uh, preventing an attacker from preemptively guessing what the output will be, rather than retroactively guessing. So it provides predictive resistance, but not backtracking resistance. So we don't use it for key material. We use it only for um, like NFS transaction IDs. Um, similarly, the user land arc4 random, which um, Theo gave a talk about just an hour or two ago, um, we're going to re-implement that soon with uh, ChaCha8 and uh, basically have it be more or less the same as the kernel's fast uh, PRNG. Um, although, I did some surveys and I, I, I couldn't find any code that uses the arc4 random API to generate key material. Um, if you know of such code, please let me know. Um, I would like it if there weren't such code so we could just not penalize the code that doesn't need backtracking resistance. Um, but uh, I would like to know if anybody really does use it for key material. Um, for key material, as I said earlier, if you, you want to generate a key, use devu random. Um, I looked at OpenSSH, and um, I don't recall what it uses to generate keys, but I'm Okay. I, I had thought that OpenSSH used the OpenSSL PRNG, but maybe not. I don't remember. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I see some people not shaking their heads. So, yeah, so, but the, the what, what, yeah. So the, the, the question for the recorded audience is, um, uh, um, well, uh, doesn't OpenSSH use ARC4 random for uh, session keys? Um, and Jorg says it, it does, but only in the child process. And the child process will have only one session. Um, future child processes will be reseeded separately so uh, you can't use their session keys or anything about them for total compromise of future child processes to guess the session keys of past child processes. Um, that's, my, that's, that's my guess right now, but I'm not sure about this. So we can, we can take this offline, um, uh, discuss it further. So that's, um, that's it. Uh, use devu random. Any questions? Uh, you mentioned the case of uh, dev random blocking um, in the case when it has enough entropy. Um, how how does it know when to block and when to unblock in this case? <laughs> so um, basically, uh, um, there is uh, one of these little accounting trolls sitting inside the implementation of dev random, and it um, debits a little counter every time you read data from the entropy pool, roughly. This is how it traditionally works. And once the entropy count goes down to a certain amount, then it decides, time to block. Um, this doesn't really have any physical significance. It's just the way it's traditionally done. Personally, I, I would consider just ha having it flip a coin to decide whether to block, um, just so that your code path gets exercised, and otherwise you're not led down a path of treating entropy like a, 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 a scarce resource like oil that you can deplete. So you recommend using dev u random. What about the new syscall? Wasn't didn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, the trouble with the new system call, or the new system calls, or the new system calls with multiple flags, or uh, which are different and different. Op the point is, um, there are multiple proposals floating around right now. One implemented in OpenBSD. One implemented in Linux. Um, NetBSD has a syscuddle uh, node that you can use to um, grab entropy, and that's how. Uh, yeah, I have FreeBSD too. That's how ARC4 random in libc seeds itself. It doesn't use devu random. Um, that's all well and good, but right now, if you're running an application, um, 
you can make it you know, like four lines of code to open DevU random and read from it, rather than 60 lines of C preprocessor to detect what operating system you're on, whether it has DevU random, plus the autoconf stuff to decide whatever else. Yeah. So uh, you know, soon enough, maybe there will be a standard library call um, that we can all use for generating key material. But um, right now, I still say use DevU random. Just a comment. There's a move to standardize Arc4 Random, or some similar variant in POSIX now. Oh, OK. I had not heard about that. I missed Theo's talk, I'm afraid. <laughs> More questions? Uh, so one of the big problems with uh, Def Random, uh, as you might know, uh, and Theo did mention that, is that basically you can be in change route uh, or uh, use Capsicum in FreeBSD, which we use more and more now. So uh, uh, using global namespaces to actually locate the random device, it is a bit problematic. So uh, CTL is much better solution for now, or some dedicated system call for that. Y yes. Um. Nevertheless, I think right now uh, it is much easier for most applications to get by using DevU random. And yes, but, but, but what you said about four lines of code, I think it's much complex than that because uh, sure. you also have to uh, handle the case when, when you cannot open the random and what to do next. Well, then you fail. Which Abort. Crash. <laughs> not if you are in a library. So it does complicate. Uh, well, what happens if the syscall system call fails? It is much easier to make it uh, impossible to fail, or the system call to make it impossible to fail. Sure. Uh, but yeah. understand the portability uh, yeah. argument, of course. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it would be good if, if we had a system call that were simpler than, or a, sorry, a standard library routine that were simpler than DevU random. Um, I think that sounds great, uh, but right now that's not there yet, and. Um, Another another question, uh -huh. uh, because as as far as I understand and uh, from what I saw uh, from some previous discussions uh, when uh, you guys designed all this, uh, is that you have two kinds of randomness, uh, uh, faster and uh, let's say weaker and uh, yeah, that that was the um, uh, the uh, uh, slow CTR DRBG with AES versus the fast cha cha H which I also fi find a bit controversial because uh, you pass the burden uh, to the application writer to actually decide uh, which to use. And of course, uh, I think that the better move is to uh, to remove such a burden from application writers because, because uh, uh, honestly, most of them have no idea which one to use. Yep, that's, that's, that's fair. Um, I don't disagree. Uh, what so you that? should create one AP. Oh yeah, th this is this is these are just just within the kernel. Um, uh, so with w for user land programs, dev random and dev random, it's it's all that all goes through the um, AES CTR DRBG. That all goes through the 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 slow one that's fit for key material. Yeah, I agree that using the counter mode DRBG is a much better idea, but I have written applications that use millions of bits of entropy, and AES 128-bit CTR is very, very slow when you're yes. consuming millions yes. of bits. Yeah, that, 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 so that, that's, that, was, that motivated the choice of ChaCha 8, which is very fast and even in very naive C code, and has a very low footprint, um, just a you know, couple of cache lines, so you can distribute it across CPUs. <laughs> Thank you. And why ChaCha int and not ChaCha 20? Uh, it's a lot faster. Um, and currently, uh, ChaCha 8 remains unbroken, to the best of my knowledge. So ChaCha 8, you can compute 64 bytes of output in about 300 Ivy Bridge cycles on using naive C code. Um, ChaCha 20 takes a good deal more. Uh, so did you uh, discuss with OpenBSD guys why they choose ChaCha 20? Uh, nope. <laughs> I like to be slow.
I will not repeat Jörg's uh, pointed comment about OpenBSD for the recorded audience. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, and uh, there is a, um, a fun little entropy game on the website to, uh, 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 as an instructive exercise in why you should not try to come up with your own passwords or flip a coin in your head. Um, so th this, is, this is the password manager that I use. <laughs>